Wonderful to have you both here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for uh, your willingness to do this. I guess I, I should like to begin by asking whether you think and whether you experience as Catholic Christians, um, whether you think that there is a, a, a duty on the part of Christians um, to represent a certain kind of voice in the public discourse um, and, and whether and how that plays out in your own, in your own work. And why don't we begin with you? I think it's contextual. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that there is, there's a sense, you know, so I write a column for the New York Times, which is a paper that perhaps has a slightly secular and slightly liberal <laughs> tilt to its readership. <laughs> Um, really? So I, I've heard, <laughs> I'm told by people who read the comment threads um, that there might be a slight, a slight tilt there. Uh, and so in that sense, I'm always conscious of the fact that, you know, as someone who's, who has a sort of basic worldview that is in conflict with the worldview of a lot of my readers, um, that there's a sort of, you know, there's, there's a a pointlessness to a certain kind of flame throwing in rhetoric, um, and that there is, in a sense, an obligation to sort of go the extra mile to prove that you are civil, serious, respectful, um, as open, if not more open, to opposing arguments than your interlocutors, and so on. Um, and so, so there's a sense in which I generally, not, not always, not always perhaps on Twitter.com, but generally feel myself sort of boxed into a kind of civility by necessity, that it's a kind of discipline imposed on me by the distinctively weird platform that I have and the position that I'm in um, there, which I think is a good thing, it's a good spiritual and intellectual discipline. Um, but it doesn't, I, it doesn't mean, I think, that the same kind of style and the same kind of civility makes sense for every argument and every situation. Uh, and I think if you look you know, at the history of the world and the history of the church, um, there is, there's room for and a need for a kind of polemical edge in argumentation that I don't usually employ in writing for my readership because it wouldn't particularly work, or I employ it just, you know, on select occasions. Um, but I wouldn't want, you know, in sort of defending the importance of civility to exclude the usefulness of polemic, because that too is part of sort of how you argue you, your way towards the truth. Yeah, I would say, I mean, as a Jesuit and as a priest, I am always trying to be charitable and loving, and that's essentially what what we do as Christians, but I also know that, uh, as you know, Matt, Matt's my boss, by the way, um, and a good now. and a good boss, at least on the masthead. That's, a <laughs> <laughs> That's right. We're all under we're all under the boss and uh, the other Jesuit in Rome too, um, you know. And I, I know as a as a Jesuit and as a priest, I I um, always only want to be charitable and loving. Um, so that's that's the first um, requirement I think of anything that I write or speak, uh, tweet, uh, and then there's another, um, I would say, constraint, which is that as a Jesuit, uh, I know that anything that I say will be seen as, I'm not the official, thank God, spokesperson for the Society of Jesus anywhere, and not even, and certainly not in the United not States. Not on Twitter? Not on Twitter. Okay. <laughs> and yet people say, oh, well, the Jesuits think this, or um, I'm very conscious, and Matt and I have had these discussions, that people say, America Magazine thinks this. So I know that it reflects on uh, the Society of Jesus, on the church, and on America Magazine. So I'm very careful um, about what I say and how I say it. And I think the difficulty for me is, um, you know, when people push back, I want to be a little more polemical, but I have to stay within the bounds of charity. Um, and I, th I think you can do that uh, as a Christian. And I think so, so sending that message that you can be a Christian in the public square, or at least on Twitter or Facebook, uh, and be charitable, I think is also something that's a good uh, project for me. And, and I hope for all Christians. For better or for worse, a lot of people perceive you to be representative of Catholic Christians. And so I wonder, do you feel some specific or uh, additional responsibility in addition to you know, what what, uh, you know, what is incumbent upon all of us to do? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think 
journalism, which is, I think, perhaps more my vocation than public intellectualism, whatever exactly that might be. I think journalism, yeah, by its nature, you know, you, you aren't a successful journalist unless you have a certain degree of notoriety. And with a certain degree of notoriety comes an obligation to be, um, to be, to attempt to be some kind of exemplar and to show readers, viewers, listeners, and so on that, um, that Christianity is something that, you know, manifests itself in the way that Christians behave in public. And so, yes. Um, again, though, I would qualify that by saying so that, you know, there, there's, there's an obligation to engage with people who disagree with you, to attempt to persuade and convince and change their minds and so on. That's sort of the ultimate goal of a kind of public writing career in certain ways. Um, but you also have to recognize in that writing that, you know, it, to the extent that you're having that effect, it's like it's happening the way a drop of water wears away a stone. It's an incredibly slow process or it's, you know, it's, you're trying to sort of tweak one reader out of a hundred's understanding of something in a way that five years down the line will bear fruit when they're reading somebody else and so on. You know, you're not, you're not literally, except in rare cases, changing minds outright from column to column and argument to argument, which means in turn that part of your responsibility is to provide a kind of encouragement to people who already agree with you and feel beleaguered or dismayed or, f or don't have, you know, are, are looking for in public an argument that explains to them more clearly what they already think or already believe. Um, and this is again where the sort of the partial case for balancing civility and respectfulness with polemic comes in, which is that, you know, a big part of my job is to write for a secular and liberal audience and to, you know, prove to them that Catholic conservatives, you know, whatever exactly I am, are worth taking seriously and, you know, our ideas are worth considering and perhaps ultimately our entire worldview is worth considering. But part of my obligation is to the minority of New York Times readers or wherever else I'm writing who already agree with me and are, you know, are looking to me as, it, again, this is sort of self-aggrandizing and silly in certain ways, but as a kind of champion. So you're, you are trying to sort of be a champion in argument and so on. And that striking that balance is one of the challenges of the job, but it's an, it's an important balance to strike. You don't, you know, there's sort of a tightrope when you're, when you're writing in public where if, you know, if you're writing for people who disagree with you, you can fall off very easily to one side and simply become the kind of tamed the tamed Catholic, let's say. It's like, well, even, even the Catholic Ross Douthat agrees with us that Donald Trump is bad, right? right? Which I do, right? you know, I, I, I don't think Donald Trump is good, but in, in, that, in that sort of tipping lies a peril where you, you sort of become incorporated into a pre-existing worldview instead of being a challenge to it. So you don't want to fall off too far to that side, even as you don't want to fall off too far to the other side where you're so polemical and argumentative that you know, there's, there's no sort of initial point of common ground from which you can argue fruitfully. Yeah, it, that seems to me to be something that you actually have in common in the sense that, um, Father Jim, you, uh, I think, it's fair to say, have, feel a sense of responsibility for a part of your audience and you know, who are sympathetic to your views and, and, and are deliberate about saying things that uh, that support them and that, that, that lift them up. I think is, that, is that fair to say? I think that's accurate. I mean, I, I think, you know, as you were talking, Ross, and as you just asked that question, Matt, I was thinking of the, I think it's attributed to Dorothy Day, um, who worked right around here. I think it's the duty of the Christian is to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. Uh, you know, and so there, there, is a, there is a duty to, you know, as you were saying, to, to give support to people for example, on the, on the, I've been writing a lot about refugees and immigrants. Um, it's an important social issue, and also I worked for two years with refugees in East Africa. And so, for example, to give people who are supporting more welcome for refugees and immigrants, you know, for example, biblical texts or, or reflections on why Jesus would have you know, welcomed the stranger, those kinds of things is very important. By the same token, to challenge people who might not agree with that. 
So there, there's, I think it's kind of twofold. For me, um, you know, also, uh, this is very much, um, as it is for you, Matt, um, it's a ministry. And so I see all, really, all of what I do um, in writing, but, you know, beyond in my priestly ministry and my Jesuit ministry as the ministry that flows out of my Jesuit vocation, and it is a ministry of the word, so, so that's very Jesuit. Uh, one of the first things that uh, St. Ignatius did when he founded the Society of Jesus, or after he did, was to buy a printing press, right? And so Jesuits have always been known as preachers and, and writers and ministers of the word. So, you know, when I'm on Twitter or Facebook, um, or I write books or articles for America, uh, I, it, it is, for me, um, a ministry. And it is just like, it is very much like preparing a homily. That's, one of, that's why one of the, the first thing I do in the morning in terms of tweeting is I do a little mini uh, homily, a little gospel tweet that kind of grounds me and reminds me that this, this is a ministry for me and this is all in the context of the gospel. So, um, so everything is seen in that context. My Jesuit vocation, a ministry, and the gospels. Um, and I tend to, I mean, unlike Ross, who knows 10 times more about politics than I do, uh, no, which is true. It's I, all um, useless, useless well, knowledge. <laughs> I, I try to, I try, and you know, Matt was in politics for a while. I try to consciously stay away from anything that's overtly political because that's outside of my wheelhouse. And also I think it's not a good thing for priests um, or religious to, to get involved in that way. But as we see from Pope Francis, if I tweet something out, uh, that is something from the gospel or that's, that's based on something that Jesus taught and it has political implications, that's, that doesn't bother me. Or if there is a political event that's going on that deserves a uh, Catholic or Christian vantage point, I'm happy to engage that way too. What do you think about that, Ruth? I, I mean, I think it's, it's a slightly difficult distinction to maintain, though. Don't you, I mean, don't, don't you oh, sort sure. of find that in oh, your... Yeah. Engagement, I mean, with, you know, where it's sort of, you know, if to the, to the extent that you're taking a position on how the gospel applies to a particular political situation, you're taking a position on the politics of it, right? Um, so to take a case where I think you and I generally agree, for instance, that the current Republican tax bill is too weighted towards the rich, right? You're taking a position there that is, you know, rooted in Catholic social teaching and so on, but it also requires a specific judgment about the contents of the bill and, you know, ultimately sort of specific, excuse me, empirical questions about the growth effects of the bill, you know, to, to what extent is supply side theory correct versus other economic theories and so on. Um, and I think, you know, one of the, I think what I occasionally see in, your critics on Twitter is a sort of frustration with, uh, with the, first, the first part of the argument, that mm -hmm. you're sort of not engaging in politics when they feel that, you know, in the second part of the argument you clearly are, and that, that mm -hmm. there's a distinction there that doesn't actually, that doesn't necessarily hold, right? Mm -hmm. um, where it's easier for me because I'm just engaging, and, you know, I mean, I'm a political columnist, yeah. <laughs> it's, all, it's all politics, um, and I pretend to expertise that, you know, is actually vindicated in the real world. No, that's true, and I think that's a fair point, and it is an art. Uh, when, it, when is it uh, political and when is it not political? And I, I try as far as possible to just apply the gospel, because also the gospel, I mean, we have to actualize the gospel in some way, and so in some way you have to kind of engage that political sphere. Uh, but I really try hard to, you know, not use political language for one thing, Democrat, Republican. I try not to, uh, you know, say who to vote for, those kinds of things. So, yeah, I mean, it's, they're going to have political implications, but I try very hard to just sort of say this is how, this is, this is a gospel passage, for example, or this is a, uh, a sort of theological understanding of Catholic social teaching that I think is helpful for this situation without tipping my hand too much. And I, I think... For most, for most people, I think they understand what I'm trying to do. And I think it's, it's part of the Jesuit uh, call to find God in all things, to really mix things up in the world. But it is, it, it's, it's, it's sometimes it's a hard boundary to figure out, uh, you know, where it is. It, it, it seems to me that, there, that you, you both feel some obligation to, uh, to, to support the, the the folks that you feel are part of your core audience, and, and also to challenge 
folks that you feel need to be challenged. Um, how do you know when you've gone too far? <laughs> how do you know when you've, that you, when you've stepped the line? Or, or more, I suppose maybe a better way of putting it is to say, how do you know when you're about to? Right. And then you take a step back. How do you know when you're about to? Um, I think that I generally don't uh, tweet, write, speak uh, when I'm very angry about something. Um, when I'm tempted to do ad hominem attacks, uh, you know, on the person, I take a step back. Um, and also when I, 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 when I don't know anything about the situation, I won't say anything. Uh, and so those are always places where I know not to say something. So if I'm very angry, you know, what, whatever has happened in the political world or the religious world, uh, if I am tempted to attack the person, you know, I'm so angry at person X, Y, Z, or if I don't know anything about the situation, why would I say anything if I don't know anything about something? I'm not going to, I mean, for example, like the intricacies of the tax bill. I mean, I, I went to Wharton, I know a little bit about, you know, tax accounting, things like that, but you know, I'm not going to just sort of shoot my mouth off about a particular thing that I know nothing about. Um, you know, it's very hard to know by the comments if you've said something untoward, because I, I've often said right. that I can say that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and I would get hate tweets saying, why don't you like the Holy Spirit? <laughs> I have, and also, I think that there's a certain level of... Um, well, there's a certain lack of sometimes, I will say, and those are always good weasel words, sometimes a lack of theological um, education that if you say something that is very um, simple, you know, Jesus is fully human and fully divine, you will get people who will just go insane. And so that, so in other words, the, the pushback sometimes does not indicate that you have stepped over the boundary, right? I mean, I, so I, I, I trust... Um, my conscience, uh, and, and thoughtful people who might push back to say, oh, that's interesting, maybe I've gotten that wrong. But, but the amount of hate tweets that you get does not indicate uh, necessarily that you've, you've crossed the line. It just may mean that you've crossed someone else's line, you know, which is what Jesus did. So it's, I think theological, theological tweeting uh, is very dangerous. Uh, <laughs> because, you know, I, I'm, uh -huh. not, I'm not a scholar, but one of my favorite lines, and this is, this is uh, a, a friend of mine who is a, a theology professor at Fordham University, who will go uh, nameless, and again, I do not have this credential, but she said once in a tweet, you know, she said something perfectly reasonable about the nature of God, and she got all these hate tweets, you know, about people who clearly did not have the same sort of theological education that this PhD did, and she said, your ability to Google does not equal my PhD. Um, and so in other words, that does not necessarily mean, the pushback that you get on social media does not necessarily mean that you've said something untoward. Okay, well I agree with the last part. Um, <laughs> and I, I think that, yeah, it's, it can be, it's a grave mistake to assume that just because you're making people upset uh, that you have necessarily crossed a line, and people just get upset, no matter what. That's the nature of that's the nature of the internet. Um, and then there's, you know, and and I completely agree about um, the ad hominem issue. I, I think that regardless, there there are very rare circumstances, like the death of Hugh Hefner, where an ad hominem attack seems to me entirely appropriate. Um, and with those, with those exceptions, it is almost always, regardless of, you know, whether it is, you know, absolutely morally correct or not, it is almost always counterproductive mm -hmm. because it makes you look mm -hmm. bad, petty, small, um, you know, bigoted, stupid, you know, sexist, and, and so on down the line, depending on anti-Jesuit, depending on who you happen to be attacking. <laughs> um, so, so there. That is all true. Now, at the same time, like, the internet is stupid, but it's not that stupid, right? And there are times when, uh, you know, we, we are all, well, I'm going to make a comparison that you mm -hmm. can then disagree with slightly, but I sometimes feel that the way I engage with certain secular readers a little bit to my left politically um, might be similar to the way that 
you engage with certain Catholics who might be slightly more conservative than you are, in the sense that you think you're engaged in a kind of constructive dialogue whose ultimate point is to sort of bring those readers along to your position. And when, when people point that out, as they do with me quite frequently, they'll say, don't you understand he's trying to get you to join him in some sort of integralist Catholic theocracy, you know, don't, with, his, with his clever tricks. Like, you know, that can be absurd, but it can also be true <laughs> in the sense that, you know, I'm not actually trying to build a Catholic theocracy, whatever that might be, um, but I am trying, you know, when I make an argument with liberals about, you know, let's say we're talking about, um, you know, the, the, the rape and sexual assault crisis on campus and so on. And I'll say, well, here's my perfectly reasonable suggestion. We should return to single-sex dorms on college campuses. And I, I think that's a perfectly reasonable suggestion that could be embraced by secular liberals without doing violence to any of their basic premises. Right. But it is also true that I have a broader intellectual project in mind, which goes well beyond single-sex dorms on college campuses, and is, you know, is connected to views of marriage and abortion and the sexual revolution and everything else that is in conflict with basic liberal premises. So people who say, you know, when he says this sort of innocent-seeming thing, he's actually trying to get to X, Y, and Z, those people aren't wrong. And similarly, I think in some of the arguments that you might have with, you know, maybe people, people to your right theologically, or that this, you know, this, this, um, this anonymous scholar might have with people who are sort of quick to Google, I don't know if it's completely true that, you know, you're, that, that sort of things that, that seem innocent and simple are completely innocent and simple, in that you do have a larger worldview that you're trying to persuade people and draw people into, and things like Christology, the nature of the Eucharist, you know, and so on down a longer list, are all connected to that worldview. So while some of the people saying, you know, some of the people Googling up, you know, a document from the Council of whatever in the 17th century are doing so either in bad faith or in this sort of ignorant Google Catholic kind of way, sometimes, sometimes the challenge is correct insofar as they, they want to drive on to the next point. They want to say, okay, yes, we agree, we agree with you, Father Martin, on this specific point, but you want to go to X, and we want to go to X too, and we want to argue there. And it's not entirely fair to them, as it's not entirely fair to my liberal interlocutors, to pretend that you don't ultimately want to get to point X. You do ultimately want to get to point X, right? Well, no. Okay. <laughs> Civil um, disagreement. No, I mean, We're I, modeling I, it right here. I, I do understand what you're saying, and I, I appreciate it, but I think, for me, it's more like a parable. I mean, the parable is put out by Jesus to get to, as they say, to tease the mind into active thought. And so a lot of the things that I will tweet out about the Gospels or about Jesus really are to, you know, as a, as a good Jesuit spiritual director would, um, you know, which I try to be a good Jesuit spiritual director, would be to get people to think about Jesus in a new way, or think about the Gospels in a new way, or think about what Jesus said in Matthew 25 in a new way. And so that's one of the reasons that I don't engage too much on Twitter, because my project really is to allow people or invite people to encounter Jesus in a way that they might not have thought of before. And so the, the project, and I, I know this is, this is not meant to sound overly pious, but um, the project really is, is getting people to encounter Christ. And, and yeah, you could say, well, which Christ or, or what parts of Jesus' message? And it's a, it's, it's, it is, again, to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable, and also to sometimes, you know, as a good homilist would, or even a good spiritual director would, throw something out there that might be surprising to people, and to allow them, like a parable would, to just sort of ponder it. So I don't presume really to say this is, this is my project and this is my agenda. I want to share the Jesus that I know with people and to allow them to uh, see what he's like and see if they like him. Uh, and hopefully, I think, turn them eventually to the Gospels and, and to their own relationship with Jesus. So that's why I find that these, these uh, people on social media that try to 
pin me down and kind of engage me in a debate, it would be like engaging Jesus in a debate about the parables, you know? Like, well, what, what do you mean the woman who sweeps up her house to find a corn? Are you saying that God is a woman? And it's like, well, no, it's actually, it's a metaphor. Well, why would you say that, that she's sweeping up and, and she's not, uh, you know, building a house? I mean, that, so it's, I think it's trying to be a little bit more uh, provocative, but not with a design other than to get people to think about Jesus in, a, in perhaps a new way. That, that really is my project as a Jesuit. And if they think that it's, it has an agenda, then I can't do much about that. But you do have theological and moral convictions. Oh, I do, but I don't feel... And you do have an opinion on, sure. you know, the, some of the specific controversies that occasionally we've differed on in, yeah. in, in the sort of the Francis pontificate, right? Correct. And so, it, so in that sense, it would be unlikely, I think, psychologically, if that sort of, if, you know, if those issues, which are, I think, issues of great moment in the church didn't inform these sometimes teasing, sometimes elliptical provocations. Sure, so, but I don't, I don't. I mean, to take, just to yeah. take the example of, of, we were talking about film before, um, before we came on because of, you know, this, this center hosts a lot of um, wonderful events on the arts and film and so on. Um, you know, but it, you know, in the case, you did a lot of work on Martin Scorsese's silence. Um, you, you know, and you wrote a lot about it and you wrote sort of interpretations of the film that you, you know, you specifically um, sort of used them to engage with intra-Catholic debates about Amoris Laetitia and, you know, and, and those, those kind of things. So it, it's not, you know, I, 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 think, I, I think it's fair to say that, you know, in, we're all engaged in an argument about the future of Catholicism right now, an argument that the Holy Father himself has sort of invited. And I think there's a frustration sometimes on the more conservative and traditional side where would-be reformers, um, and I'll, I'll speak generally rather than specifically, would-be reformers sometimes don't, don't want to say that we're having an argument even as they have an argument. And so on the conservative side, there's this perpetual drive, and maybe it's a too zealous drive that's missing, missing Jesus along the way, which is a sort of conservative or traditionalist vice perhaps, but there's a drive to get to the actual argument. What are, you know, what are we actually, what are we actually arguing about, which is, again, I think the, the thing that motivates at least some of your social media mm -hmm. critics, um, not the ones just flinging ad hominem attacks, um, but the ones who feel that there is, you know, there's a debate of great moment in the history of the church going on right now that's worth, that's worth having. No, I think that's fair. Um, I certainly have opinions uh, about the way that, you know, about Amoris Laetitia and about uh, Pope Francis and things like that. But I think I also, and I don't mean to imply that you're saying this, but I, I also don't mean to, I, I, well, no, I, I don't need to, in a sense, win the argument. And so I'm less interested in the debate. Because uh, time well, is greater than space. No, yeah, because. Space is greater. <laughs> right. I'm less interested in the debate uh, and more, inter more interested in kind of encouraging people to think about things in a new way. Um, at, you know, as Jesus in the Gospels is less interested, you know, for example, when he is sometimes. asked, sometimes, sometimes, but when he is asked about the reign of God, he does not respond with the definition. He responds with stories. He was called parables. He was, you know, the reign of God is like this. And it frustrated people back then. And I think I'm much more comfortable with that, you know, as you say, elliptical or parabolic way of speaking. Uh, and eventually I find the debating, at least on social media, and you and I have had good, good discussions on social media. I think sometimes the debate- On social media? Or on, well, we, did, think, that, that, we did that back yeah. in well, the- Well, if you count America Magazine. America, America, America. Magazine. No, I think the America, America Magazine yeah, website right. dialogue that's was right. a model of engagement. Yeah. Um, Our Twitter engagements. Are, yeah. <laughs> not sure I can play much for that. I think <laughs> the, um, you know, I, I'm less interested in having debate because I find that, that theological and religious debates on social media, sometimes with uh, more traditional Catholics, devolve into uh, just proof texting and quotations. And I find that not very appealing and not very convincing for people. So if, you, if someone quotes me something from Pope Benedict and I quote something from you know, the Gospels and they quote something back uh, to me from the Council of Trent, and 
And I find that they sometimes... It's all good stuff, though. It, it is good stuff. Right. But I also find that that, you know, as... You know, there's a reason that Jesus didn't give a definition about the reign of God, which is because it would devolve into a debate. Instead, he gives them the parable. And I feel much more comfortable as a Jesuit with that elliptical, parabolic way of, of, of doing things, and then not really always following the debate to its logical end. Because I, I sometimes think that's not, that's actually unhelpful for people. You know, I mean, I'll, I'll discuss and debate to a point, but after a while, a, a lot of times on social media, it also becomes, let's, let's get this person. Let, let, let us trap him in, right. you know, some sort of uh, theological mistake. Um, and I mean, is it fair to say that, uh, Ross, is it fair to say that um, it, it, it's not necessarily true that every intervention or argument that Father Martin makes in pub a public space is connected to some larger theological project that he, or argument that he has in mind, right? I hope not. And, yes. and Jim, it's probably fair to say that sometimes it is, right? Yeah, well, it depends what you mean by project. I mean, for example, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna make something up. My, my motivation on Twitter and Facebook and, and, and in America Magazine and other articles is not to get people to vote Democrat, period. That is not my goal, you know? My motivation is really to get them to encounter Jesus. It would be the same kinds of things that I, I, I consider it the same way that I consider a homily. And that a homily may have certain political implications or overtones, but it is about the gospel, just as the stuff that Jesus said in his times had certain political implications that he was okay with. Um, so I, I try as far as possible to be focused on Jesus. And the other thing, Ross, is that I also find that, I mean, maybe unlike yourself, I find the debates qua debates not enjoyable for me. I would much rather, you know, go back to my book on prayer. I just, I don't find them enjoyable. And, and, the, and maybe someone who's more of a polemicist or more of someone who's, um, you know, used to kind of debating politically enjoys that more. I find that I don't enjoy it. And so that's another reason personally why I kind of step back from it. It's, it's not enjoyable for me. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm much more, I'm much more, I'm much happier sort of giving a story or, or throwing out something that's like a homily than I am with, you know, going at it with someone hammer and tongs. Mm -hmm. You want something from the conversation that doesn't, or... You, that, yes, I, I, that, feel, that I, mean, I feel like... You feel isn't there. Uh, yes, I, I think that I... I think that there are, you know, as in other areas of our common life, in Catholicism right now, there are very important questions up for debate that have, I think, implications in many cases that go well beyond sort of the particular, you know, divorce and remarriage and communion question that sort of go to, you know, again, the, the very nature of the church, but also the very nature and person of Jesus Christ. Um, and the... And, and it, yeah, it, it does seem that while it can be the case that, you know, debates can continue for a long time and can be open-ended in certain cases and not every question has to be resolved and so forth, um, it's also the case that these questions are resolved in the actual life of the church every day in specific ways. Um, you know, how, you know, liturgical debates are resolved every day in the way that, that, that the liturgy happens in parishes all over the world. Um, specific moral and theological debates are resolved every day in the choices that Catholics make about the sins that they confess, um, you know, the life choices they make, whether they take communion, when and how they get married, and so on. There are immense and sweeping practical implications for these sort of abstract theological debates. And of course, you know, you know, moment to moment, sort of those individual choices are not being conditioned by either newspaper columns or papal encyclicals. Um, but over time, since Catholicism is a culture in which we all try and live and move and have our being and so on, those, those intellectual debates do, you know, inevitably shape the choices people make, the way they pray, the way they believe, what they think about the person of Jesus, who they think Jesus is, to what extent, you know, to what extent do you see Jesus primarily as a figure who 
Yeah, who, right, who avoids sort of narrow and too specific answers and speaks in parables and stories and narratives and so on. And to what, versus, to what extent do you see Jesus as someone who does that, but also on particular questions delivers very hard to accept answers that send people running away from him because they think those answers are too hard to accept, too hard for people to live out, too difficult to believe and so on. And again, sort of the view of Jesus that you have, and you, you, know, you don't just see this in Catholicism, you see this all across the constellation of Protestant churches, inevitably informs the way people live out their faith and the way churches develop and transform over time. So um, I probably have a stronger appetite for this kind of, you know, this kind of argument than um, Father Martin does, and probably that reflects a certain kind of journalistic personality disorder that you're required to have to be a pundit. But at the same time, I think there is a justifiable frustration in, you know, I mean, to, to, to bring it to, to a finer point, right? The central question before the church right now, boiled down, you might say, is how can doctrine, what does it mean, what do we mean when we say doctrine can develop, right? What are the limits of the development of doctrine? Um, what can change and what can't change? And there is, a, I think, a conspicuous failure on the conservative side, less so on the traditionalist side, but on the conservative side, to have a completely coherent story about what can change and what can't that makes sense of all the very real changes that have happened right. in the Catholic Church since the 19th century um, um, and through Vatican II to the present. Uh, but then, but if there is that real failure on the conservative side, on the liberal side, there is a risk that, you know, there's a risk of sort of descending into a kind of pure papal positivism, where you're simply saying, well, you know, doctrine develops when the Pope says it develops, and we sort of work, work up the intellectual explanations after the fact and so on, which is a Protestant caricature of Catholicism brought to life in certain ways. And, you know, I, I, I don't like seeing that, caricature brought to life. I don't find it persuasive or convincing or something that I can realistically put my trust in. And so to that extent, there is, there is a, a need on both sides of this divide that we have over these various controverted questions to think more deeply and argue more deeply about what what we believe when we say the church can change this and can't change this and where the lines are and what kind of system or theory actually makes sense of it. Um, and that's not your job in particular, that's not you know, your ministry in particular, but it's, it's the backdrop of yeah. a lot of these controversies right now. Well, and I, I, would, I would agree with that. I think that development of doctrine is, an, is a key question for, is a key question for the church. I you think, think it's a, the central question? No, I'm, not, I'm now gonna sound pious again. I think the central question for the church and for Catholics is who is Jesus? I think that is the central question. I think people are still coming to encounter Jesus and that is, the, that is always gonna be the question for the church to get people to encounter Jesus. I think the development of doctrine helps people to understand that. I think the thing, talk about frustration, I think the thing that frustrates me uh, with some of the more traditionalist Catholics is that doctrine, you know, as you were saying, has always developed. Doctrine has developed since, you know, Peter and Paul argued about circumcision, right? I mean, we're always sort of developing doctrine. Uh, the essentials stay the same. Of course, the question is, what are the essentials? But, mm -hmm. I mean, we look at, you know, we look at uh, the Second Vatican Council, we look at even St. John Paul, you know, and all of his social encyclicals, who in those social encyclicals develop the doctrine of the Catholic social teaching, you know, deeper and deeper and deeper. And, and my frustration is that suddenly, you know, some traditionalists, now that Francis is here, uh, have suddenly have a problem with development of doctrine. You know, that, that it was fine under... I'm not well, the traditionalists are consistent, though. The traditionalists had a problem right. With, with, right. with John Paul and right. to a lesser extent with Benedict, but even with him. It's the conservatives who I think you're more, you know, the, the, the sort of thus far and no further Yeah, and I, I, I don't understand really, I, I really have a hard time understanding, and again, this is not you, some people, uh, you know, who often uh, critique Francis, uh, particularly Catholics, um, who say that, uh, you know, who, who openly attack Francis and who openly attack, you know, some of his uh, teachings, like a Morris Laetitia, which is, you know, it's a magisterial teaching now, 
who under John Paul and under Benedict uh, said that any dis disagreement with the Pope uh, in any way was kind of dissenting. And that to me is the great paradox or irony of the, of the antipathy against Pope Francis. That is to say, uh, people who said that you could never disagree with Pope John Paul or Pope Benedict are now disagreeing with Pope Francis all over the place. And it's, it's a very hard thing for me to see because I think, it, I don't, I think it's, a, it's a kind of continuation. I don't think it's, yeah. it's a rupture. But and, is it also true that, uh, that there is a certain sort of person who may have disagreed uh, with Benedict or with Pope John Paul II who ha I have kind of morphed into this uh, papal positivist and um, you know are, are saying you can't disagree with what the Pope is saying. Yeah, that, that, that's the irony, right. That, right? That's the other irony, the people that, that, that uh, did not support the Pope you know, under uh, Benedict and uh, John Paul are suddenly ultramontanists. Right. Uh, they're suddenly, the, 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 as, as John O'Malley says, papalatry. Uh, so yeah, I, I think it's, it's to help people see, I mean to your point, for me, more important than, in a sense, winning the argument is to help people see church history, to help people see the gospel, to help point things out to them that they might not normally know. Um, and that, that's how I see my role, which is to help, is to get people, Catholics especially, to get them to think about things and maybe point something out uh, that, they, that they might not have known before uh, about uh, church teaching. You know, it's funny, uh, one of my favorite uh, tweets recently uh, was uh, one by Dave Gibson, who now runs Fordham Center for Culture. It was a religion news service uh, reporter who tweeted a very strong quote from Pope Benedict, uh, Pope Emeritus Benedict, about uh, the primacy of conscience, you know, from 1962. And so to sort of, you know, encourage people to say, look, here are some things that are part of our tradition that you might not be aware of and that, you know, that, that is a lot richer and deeper than just these kind of yes or no black or white debates that we're having. But at the same time, there is an, and again, as, as you kindly exclude me, I will exclude you, but there is, there is an argument where that essentially, I think, tries to exclude everything that happened in church history before 1962, Correct. right? Where, uh, you know, you have um, uh, sort of, especially maybe younger traditionalist inclined Catholics sort of digging back into the magisterium of the 19th century popes. Um, and, you know, and sometimes, again, sort of critiquing Francis in certain ways or critiquing some of his allies. The church is teaching presently unique um, among Christian denominations, major Christian denominations throughout the world on divorce and remarriage does draw directly from that. And it draws from a place where Jesus is asked a direct question and doesn't offer, you know, a parable or a sort of fun evasion about rendering unto Caesar or something. He answers the question in ways that shock his audience. And so my sort of, to me, and I think many other people on the quote unquote conservative or traditional side, we feel like in these debates, we're not defending arid abstract doctrine or something. We're defending the thing about the Catholic Church that is impressive, that it is on something as hard as that question. It's trying in a flawed and complicated and compromised and elements over here, et cetera, kind of way to be true to the guy you want people on Twitter to see anew and see afresh, see in a new light. And you, you, you know, we don't want to, we, we don't want to sell out Jesus, however imperfectly we're following him in our own life. I would say, however, uh, that that is not what is most impressive to me about the Catholic Church, that the way that that's framed. What's most impressive to me of the Catholic Church is exactly the response to that, which is mercy, and that what the Pope is trying to do in the case, and we've, I think we've gone back and forth on this before. Once or twice. Once or twice. <laughs> in Amoris Laetitia is that pastoral application of the teaching, which includes mercy, which includes the primacy of conscience. And I think what frustrates me is that sometimes in the dialogue, those two things, mercy, which is rooted in the Gospels, and the primacy of conscience, which is firmly rooted in Catholic tradition, you know, are not given due weight. And, and I think that what Pope Francis is trying to do, particularly in Amoris Laetitia, is to, in a sense, resurrect mercy, which he has been doing as, I think that's the great theme of his pontificate. I mean, I think all of his, his, his uh, encyclicals and uh, le apostolic letters cohere around that, but also to raise up the, the tradition of primacy of conscience. And so that 
So that it is not, and I'm not implying that you're saying this, it is not simply an application of rules. Important as those rules are, coming from the lips of Jesus, I mean, John Meyer in his book, A Marginal Jew, spends the whole fourth volume on telling us how that is historically accurate, his teaching on divorce. But to also look at the traditions uh, from the Gospels and from our history of mercy and primacy of conscience. And so that, to me, that's the response to, to that sort of worldview. And I think what I would like from the traditionalists is a, in a kind of, in a, is a generous reading of Amoris Laetitia uh, as, a, as a tool for pastoral application of, of what are very good rules. He is not saying, of course, throw out the rules, but he is also saying apply them in a pastoral way. Around the Synod on the family, um, you two had an exchange. And uh, I think you had an exchange on Twitter, and then you had a private exchange, and then you decided to bring it public. And uh, we published it at America Magazine. You both acknowledged the, the, the difficulty with even mm, finding the right language to talk about how we disagree with one another as church, right? You both kind of acknowledged that this, this dyadic or binary way of talking about the, the church is um, somewhat problematic. And I, I, I agree with that. So, but yet at the same time, to your point, Ross, we have to, there are serious issues at stake here, and there are serious disagreements, and we need to have an argument, an argument in the truest sense of the term. How do we do that as a church in a way that doesn't simply replicate the problems that we have with the discourse in the, in the public square? Well, I would say two things. First of all, I would say always by uh, assuming the best of people. I mean, I assume, and I know, just from his writing, that Ross is a good Catholic. So I, I assume that, I know that. <laughs> <laughs> you try to be a good Catholic. Appearances but, can be yeah. deceiving. <laughs> but you know, I mean, in the best possible way, you assume the person has good intentions, that this is not a person who's out to destroy the church or something like that. Uh, the second thing is to really try to understand the uh, other side's position, and I really do understand that, that this is an important rule, and you cannot simply just toss rules out the window, especially ones that are founded in the Gospels, you know? So to really take that seriously, uh, rather than saying, that's baloney, you know, he doesn't know what he's talking about, that's a threadbare argument, that has no validity, no claim on me, but to really engage it. I mean, you know, when Jesus is responding to people uh, in the Gospels, he takes them seriously. You know, when people say, what is the reign of God? Is it here yet? He doesn't say, well, that's a stupid question. Right? I'm not answering that. You know, pass me the fish. Um, you know, he says, you know, let, let me try to explain it to you. So, so he takes them seriously. He tries to understand where they're coming from. And he also, I think this is very important, he speaks in their language. Uh, and so one of the things I always like to say is that when Jesus uh, met the first disciples by the Sea of Galilee, he does not speak in the language of a carpenter. He does not say, let us construct the house of God. He does not say, let us lay the foundations for the reign of God. He says, come follow me and I will make you fishers of men, fishers of people actually. He's speaking to them in their, their language. So I think part of it is taking people where they are, whoever it is, if it's Ross Douthat or, or someone on Twitter or someone in the parish who stops me on the steps, speak to them in their language, understand what they're trying to ask, uh, presume good intentions, and I don't think you can go wrong with that. If you, if you keep those in mind, I think you'll be fine. You know, you may, you may not convince the person, you may not persuade the person, but I think it's, it's the basis for a good conversation. I agree with that. Um, I think it is also important to recognize that, you know, divisions can be Divisions can be real and ultimately unbridgeable. A third view is perhaps that um, these three popes were responding to different problems and different Absolutely. Times, right. And that in some, someone, I think, could, could argue that uh, Pope Francis is, what, what Pope Francis is doing in encouraging this openness is is, is in part possible because of the, the, the boundaries that were established through the various interventions of his predecessors who were responding to a different time and a different challenge. And, but in order for that to even work, <laughs> um, I think you have to believe that, that there is a, that there is a, a force at right. work, that the right. Holy Spirit is at work 
that it is guiding the church um, and giving us the right person at the right, right. moment in its history. And, but that has to be you, different. I don't, I don't think you, I mean, I think, again, you, you have to have cosmic optimism, yes. But as, you know, none other than Benedict Ratzinger himself but that's said, the only you, can't believe, you can't believe that the Holy Spirit picks every pope. Because well, Benedict, then the Holy Spirit is picking you know, the pope even, who rapes and murders pilgrims. Right. And tw- like, you, you can't, you can't have, there, there's a, na- again, this is what I mean by naive confidence. You can't have a naive confidence that every pope is doing exactly the right thing. And this is important, by the way, for conservative Catholics. I mean, again, yeah. this is, again, where, you know, our disagreements with Pope Francis are themselves a kind of, you know, now here I'll go saying it is the Holy Spirit ultimately, right? But <laughs> they're a kind of spiritual discipline to encourage people who were perhaps papalatrists under yeah. John Paul and Benedict to recognize that, you know, that it, it's, not, it's not always going to be this, you know, what, what you expect or want from sure. Rome. And it's okay to be disappointed in, you know, off-the-cuff papal utterances in the midst, not that you've ever been disappointed in any off-the-cuff right. papal <laughs> utterance, but hypothetically, <laughs> hypothetically, it's I have okay been. to have, no, I, I Yeah, I have I, been. I, we were talking about that before, I have been. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it's, you know, and I, it's, and I, I take right, your point, right. and uh, I don't mean to suggest that. What I, what I meant to say was that, that you, to have, at the same time, you're right, it, the Holy Spirit doesn't come in, in in a very direct way, pick every single pope. Uh, and, but at the same time, it's also not the case that it's simply uh, a, a process where, like the American political system, where we go from one administration to another to another and so right. forth, that's entirely contingent. So I guess on, the, on human influence, right? So I, I, my question then is, in terms of having a conversation as a church or an argument as a church, does that change the way that we approach that argument, the way we need to have that argument? That, it, that it's a different, it's not a polis, it's right. a different kind of reality. Well, you have to have, yeah, you, you have to have a kind of ultimate, ultimate optimism, right. right? No, which does, yeah, I, I completely agree, which does have to inform your arguments in a way, like if, you know, if, if your side is right, then you, you have to believe that you will be ultimately vindicated, and it might take 400 years, but you will be, and if your side is wrong, um, you have to believe that it's, it's a good thing that you're wrong, right? That that's, you know, that that, that too is part of the unfolding unfolding plan. So in that sense, yes, there is a, the stakes are not what they are for secular utopians of right and left engaged in these arguments where, you know, if you lose at the ballot box, you could lose forever or something. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the reality is that, um, yeah, that, that, that you, that, that for people who are skeptics and critics of Pope Francis, there's a level of spiritual disturbance that sometimes manifests itself in Father Martin's Twitter feed and sometimes elsewhere that is not appropriate given the premises of, of Roman Catholicism. Um, and and, and that, that, is, that is absolutely true. And so, you know, there are sort of similar variations on that among, among liberal Catholics. Either way, you know, you have to accept, if there's a crisis in the church, you have to accept that you know, that God is sovereign over it. And that, you know, you're in a story and you don't know exactly how the story is going to end, um, but you, you have confidence in the ultimate ending, and so that in turn enables you to have a certain level of charity in debates that, uh, you know, that you don't necessarily get in political battles, yeah. Do, do you think that's right? I do, I mean, I think that, you know, as you were saying, Matt, uh, we do have to be optimistic because we, we do believe that the Holy Spirit is guiding the church. And you're right, there was a great quote when Benedict was elected that someone resurrected, where he said, it is not true that the Holy Spirit uh, elects the popes because there are, as you were saying, there were popes that clearly you know, were rapacious and venal and things like that. But we do trust that not only that the Holy Spirit is uh, guiding the church, right, in, in the Holy Spirit's wisdom, but that in particular, uh, the people who are uh, entrusted with the, the leadership of the church are themselves blessed by a special 
charism, right? A special grace that comes with their office, we believe, and that they themselves are trying to discern the best things for the church, you know? So while I may have disagreed with different popes on different matters, I would never ever say that they weren't themselves trying to follow their own spirits, right? And their own discernment. So I think that's what's different, uh, that you, you trust that not only that the Holy Spirit is at work in these church leaders, but that they themselves are trying their best to listen to the signs of the times, to listen to the voice of the Spirit in their lives and in the church. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm always optimistic about the church, uh, and I'm very optimistic under Francis. I mean, you're right. I mean, I, he tends to uh, do some of the things and say some of the things that I agree with, um, but I would also, you know, and I would also say that, you know, I also believe that, you know, John Paul was a saint, even mm -hmm. though I didn't agree with him all the time. So there's a kind of, there's a kind of reliance on the Holy Spirit, which is a, for me is a very important part of looking at church history and where we're going. Somebody recently sent me a uh, clipping from, uh, that was a, an interview with uh, John Conorton, uh, who was a deputy mayor to uh, Robert Wagner. And, um, and because John Conorton was a lifelong subscriber to America and, and very uh, great friend of one of my predecessors. Um, and he was asked by the New York Times when he got that, um, they said, oh, you are a devout Catholic. Do you consider yourself a good Catholic? And Conorton said, uh, there are no good Catholics. There are just Catholics trying to be good. Um, and I'd like to thank these two Catholics for joining us. Mm -hmm. on. <laughs> 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 No, thank, thank you both. Thank you for your willingness to do this and for your honesty and for, um, uh, for a civil conversation. And thank you for joining us. Um, and uh, please have a blessed Advent and a Merry Christmas. Thank you. Thank you. That was fun.